as people start coming in, why don't you uh, go ahead and chat so that um, we could see where you're coming from and well, who you are. Um, we're happy to welcome everybody. Um, so we'd love to hear from you. We're gonna start uh, soon enough. Lisa, we've got some of our board members joining. There's Anne and Julia. Oh, good. Oh, from Luxor, Iris, you're you're basically a, a neighbor to our presenters right now. Hello, everybody. San Francisco, Kansas City, brilliant. Welcome to other RC chapter members also. So exciting. We had our snow yesterday in Missouri and we did not get hit as badly as we were supposed to where I am in Southern, Southern Missouri. There's Roseanne. Sunny warm, yes, now people are just bragging about their weather, so. Oh yeah, same, Julia. If you're going to RC, um, that'll be fun. I'm excited to see people. Yeah, go for it. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming. Welcome RC Missouri members and guests. My name is Stacy Davidson and I'm the president of RC Missouri. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. RC Missouri launched in April 2020 during the global pandemic with the mission of celebrating and sharing the culture and history of Egypt from the ancient through the Islamic periods with Missouri and its neighboring communities. And thankfully, our virtual events are able to expand our reach to other geographic areas and we welcome our national and international attendees to this event. RC Missouri's mission is outreach and education. We schedule presenters and topics which are accessible, interesting, and fun for all audiences. We also strive to provide a community in which institutions, professionals in the field, and non-professionals of all ages can share their knowledge, interest, and love for Egypt. You can stay up to date with RC Missouri news and events by following us on social media. We are on Facebook and Twitter, and we also have a website at www.rcmo.org. Although both RC National and RC Missouri provide free public outreach events, some lectures, workshops, and benefits are restricted to RC members. If you enjoy RC Missouri programming and would like to be more involved in our organization, visit www.rc.org forward slash membership um, and select Kansas City, Missouri to affiliate with our chapter if you are not affiliated already. Um, thank you again for joining us. Our guest speakers today, we are very excited about. We have Dr. Victoria Jensen and Mr. Mahmoud Farouk, who will be presenting Zafi Zaman, Reliving, Reviving Ancient Tree Species in Luxor. Um, we have our bios for our amazing presenters. So first we have Dr. Jensen. So Victoria Jensen received her PhD in 2019 from the University of California, Berkeley. Her dissertation was on the non-elite cemeteries of Deir el Balas and their relationship to the Royal Palace, for which she researched the previously unpublished archival information from the 1900-1901 Hearst expedition. She has lived on the West Bank of Luxor for four years, where she enjoys learning about the local culture and its connections with the ancient past. Mr. Mahmoud Farouk Salim Abid El Rasul hails from El Kurna. He loves farming and history and is particularly interested in preserving local traditions. He worked with his father, gaining experience doing restoration in Medinet Habu for 11 years, then worked in Cairo, but is happy to be back in his homeland on the West Bank. We will have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. You can put your questions in the Q&A box that should be located near the bottom of your screen. I would like to thank RC Missouri board member, Dr. Kate Shepard for hosting the event and Missouri s and for their webinar sponsorship. 
Without further ado, let's extend a warm RC Missouri welcome to Dr. Jensen and Mr. Farouk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, now I have to. <laughs> so thank you very much. And I need to share my screen and then we will start the presentation here from the beginning. There we are. <clears throat> okay, so I hope everyone can see the screen. Thank you so much for joining us. Mahmoud and I are very excited to be yeah. presenting today. So um, Zayf is a man, for those who don't know Arabic, this is a, um, a, an expression, it's like, oh, in the good old days, it's in, in the past, like in the past, like in the good old days. So we're talking about um, reviving ancient tree species in Luxor, and there are three species in particular that we're going to look at today. Um, there are lots of other indigenous trees that are doing really well, like the date palm, the nabuk tree, um, but there are three that are sort of dwindling in the number of um, of, species, of uh, specimens that are, that are in, in the area to varying degrees, some dwindling more than others. So um, we're gonna look at the dome palm and the sycamorous fig and the ishta tree. And uh, the way we're going to be splitting up our presentation is I will discuss the um, ancient um, symbolism and meaning of the trees and how, what we know about it from the past, from tomb decoration, from texts, and Mahmoud will fill us in on um, the current um, uses and, and also, you know, some stories of, of how, um, how the local population, you know, interacts with these trees. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is the dome palm. And this is a special kind of palm. As you can see on this example, it has multiple trunks going up, unlike a, a normal palm like you think of that just has one trunk and then the um, spread of, of leaves at the top. The dome has multiple trunks. And then here on this close up, you can see this is what the fruit looks like. And dome palms are depicted in the temple of Hatshepsut at uh, Dar al-Bahri as part of her scene of uh, the expedition to Punt. So some of you may be uh, aware of these scenes already. And I wanna thank Amr Shahat for the trip we had a couple years ago, going out and taking some pictures of these. So here we see the, um, the incense trees that were being brought and a dome palm off to the right here. And then here's a local house from Punt with a dome palm that's identifiable by the multiple trunks in front of that house. We also see them as an element of an idyllic garden from the app for the afterlife, where the, here in the tomb of Senegem, we have these uh, regular date palms visible with the single trunk. And then on either side, we have the dome with the splitting trunks and the larger fruit. Uh, the tomb of Amunnacht at Dar al Medina has some beautiful uh, representations. So again, you can really see the difference. The artist really captured the specific um, way that the date palm has one trunk going up on the right. And then on the left here, I've got a zoomed in image where you see the multiple fronds um, going upward and then you know, lots and lots of fruit, plenty of fruit for the afterlife. And um, <clears throat> the text reads, this is a spell for drinking water beside the Ma'ama tree. So the ancient Egyptian name for it was the Ma'ama. There's also a hymn to Thoth invoking the Dolm Palm. So it gives us more insight into the ancient Egyptians religious beliefs about this tree, which is uh, the great Dome Palm that's 60 cubits high, the one with the nuts upon it and the fruit within the nuts and the water in the fruit. And it talks about how um, this can bring water to one who is thirsty in the desert. And it is sealed to one who uncovers his mouth unwisely, but it's open to the thoughtful man. 
Um, it's a common grave gift that um, is found in many tombs in Egypt. So um, <clears throat> again, I collaborated with our friend, Dr. Amr Shahat, and he, um, on the uh, botanical materials from Daryl Balas, that was the focus of my dissertation work. So these are some of the actual examples that we have. These are held at the Phoebe Hearst Museum at University of California, Berkeley, that were sent by the Hearst Expedition, which was 1900 to 1901. And Amr and I have published an article together. There's another one in press that is looking at um, some of these food offerings, including the dome. Um, at Daryl Balas, Daryl Balas is uh, very, is non-elite, like middle class at most. So you get a few examples, you get maybe one dome fruit up to, you know, four-ish or so, three or four at the most. <clears throat> but um, 37 of the tombs did include domes, so it was a common grave gift. Uh, but larger quantities are found in more elite tombs, such as that of Kha and Merit at Daryl Medina, or also the tomb of Tutankhamun had eight baskets full of dome <clears throat> provided for him. So something I want to point out on this example on the right, and this is something, again, I want to attribute to Amr Shah, my friend, um, that this is one of the dome fruit from Daryl Balas, and you can see that it's been worked. You can see that there's a hole in here that was begun to be drilled and that the front of it is cut um, very, you know, it's very clearly been, been cut. So this is something that is, um, is continuous. <clears throat> In fact, I'm, I'm wearing today a necklace and it has the same sort of thing where it's a dome nut and it's been cut like that. The uh, interior on the ancient one is everything is turned brown, but uh, something not three, you know, not 3,000 years old will, will look white on the interior. So it's um, something still done with these today. So with that, I want to uh, turn to Mahmoud and let you talk about dome trees and um, how we collect the nuts, what people do with them in the wood and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, about the fruit. I'll, uh... We love dome. It's very interesting to us, but I didn't know this is ancient, uh, since the ancient time, since I grow. I know this is since the ancient time. We love the dome. We love the dome as a fruit. Uh, we, we, use the, we use the dome at the moment uh, for uh, high uh, blood pressure, the dry dome smash and you take it like a juice and they have vitamin C and you can use this uh, the seed to make necklace. For, but I realized the dome is disappeared. Yeah, I mean, day by day, it's disappeared it was Dr. Victoria Johnson. She started the project to make this return back to the life. We start to grow in dome. Uh, uh, Sakamoras, uh, Ishta. So we start this project because you know, I love the dome. I, I have, yeah, I, mean, I have a lot of story about dome. I have some friend they collected and they sell it in the school. It's it's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do the kids get it out of the trees? They, so they, sometimes, sometimes you know the kids they cannot reach the tree. They use a stone. They use they they throw the stone uh, because it's uh, the the, uh, the the dome. It's a lot. Then when they throw the dome, it's like bring ten or fifteen dome. Uh -huh. Then we we'll collect them. We we'll fight against each other. Then I have some friend. He take them to the school and he sell it and he make business, and it's very interesting and very tasty. We love to eat the dome as a fruit, but it's. Uh, what about the wood? Can you do things with the wood? Yes, yes. We use the, the we use the wood for the from the dome. They make some artists now. They use the wood to make uh, boat to make the uh, ancient Egyptian soldier is very uh, very strong wood. 
and it's very easy to care. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank great. You. <laughs> Okay, great. So the next uh, species we're going to look at is the sycamore fig. And this is uh, jumais in Arabic. And the ancient word for it was nehet. So um, the references that we have to it go all the way back to the pyramid text. And here we've just got several that I pulled out and they are, um, <clears throat> they're situated to the east. We'll, there's also the Ishta tree is to be in the east of the sky. So it's it's uncertain if maybe, you know, both these trees had that sort of significance. But um, but there are the two sycamores that are between here and the other side of the sky, and they ferry the king over and put me to the, put him to the eastern side of the sky. And uh, some of the last one that I have here is rather obscure and it's, you know, as far as the myth that it's referencing, a lot of the pyramid texts are, are obscure and difficult to understand because we don't have like complete mythological stories to know what it's talking about. But uh, they're saying, greeting sycamore that incorporates the God, you under whom the undersky gods stand, whose outside cooks, whose inside burns, who emits painfulness as you collect those in Nu and assemble those in the sky's arcs. So this has to do with Osiris, of course, um, it is, and it's providing shade over Osiris's head, it says, and again, protects him by barring Seth and, and his, um, his chaotic uh, force that he represents. So uh, the references continue in the Book of the Dead. So spell 59, for instance, is a formula for breathing air and having water in the God's land. This is the uh, famous papyrus of Ani in the British Museum. And, um, and here we have a lovely vignette with the sycamore tree with a goddess inside of it, providing a, um, there's a vessel with water and then also a tray for a, or a you know, mat that's got bread and other offerings on it of food. So uh, the text reads, oh, the sycamore of Newt, grant me the water and air that are in you. I am the one who embraces that place where you are. I have guarded that egg of the great cackler. As it is firm, I am firm. As it lives, I live. As it breathes air, I breathe air. So this invocation, uh, sometimes the goddess in the tree is identified as Newt, as we see here, other times as Hathor or Isis. And I just had a lovely trip uh, a couple days ago to go to Daryl Medina and get some pictures. There are lots and lots of, um, of images of this tree goddess scene in the Theban necropolis. Um, and doing some research for this talk, it was actually surprising to me. There are 51 Theban tombs that have a tree goddess scene such as this. So, um, uh, the earliest ones date to Amenhotep II. There are a few of that, that era, the mid 18th dynasty, and a few more from the reigns of Horem, Heb, and I. And, but the vast majority date to the Ramazid period. It was a hugely popular motif in the 19th and 20th dynasties. Um, and then we don't see any in the third intermediate period. Of course, decorated tombs were not um, as available to people. And then um, in the Sayite period, there are two tombs in the Asasif that revive this tradition of having a tree goddess seen, the tombs of Pediamanopet and Papasa. So here we can see that the tree goddess can be providing the, the bread and the liquid to the deceased themselves, as in the tomb of Sinejim. And it's very faint, but there was that the paint is uh, little wavy lines of water that descend into their hands. And uh, also it can be more abstracted with just the arms coming out of the tree, offering the water. And here again, we see the water wavy lines coming to the Ba of, the, of Neben Ma'at and his mm -hmm. wife here. So another beautiful example, this is the tomb of Userhat that dates to the reign of Seti I. 
And I give you here a, a plate from Davies's publication in 1927. And here we've got the tomb owners themselves receiving water from this tree goddess, as well as their boss here down below the little boss are, are also receiving. Um, this is an actual image from the tomb, a photo that I took of it. So you can really see the gorgeous detail in that tomb's decorations with this little bird on the, in the tree branches and the details of how the figs are rendered. Um, so the sycamore fig also features in uh, three love poems uh, from Papyrus Turin. And here um, I'm looking at Cynthia Shekoslami's publication where uh, there, there were three trees and the first one has had traditionally been translated that the name of the tree itself is missing and it had been interpreted to be a pomegranate. But I think um, Sheikh Oslami makes a good argument that that really should be a sycamore fig, should be understood to be a sycamore fig. Uh, but here we have the text, part of the text of the third poem, which is indubitably the tree that we're talking about. And it um, describes, you know, its beautiful attributes that it's beautiful, her foliage, foliage is lovely, she's blossoming and strong, she's loaded with cut and uncut figs, redder than jasper, and her leaves are like turquoise. And we will see that again um, <clears throat> with, um, <clears throat> with some of the imagery of the turquoise with the Ishta tree as the tree of the Eastern horizon as well. Okay, so now we're gonna get into um, what uh, we've been doing as far as getting cuttings from these trees and starting it. So here we've got Mahmoud in front of a beautiful mature tree that's on the road south of Luxor. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. To Esna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you can see how these fruits really cluster on the branches. What time of year does it have fruits? Summer. Mm. Yeah, summertime they have fruit. Mm -hmm. mm. Do they all fall off or do sometimes it's the old ones? Sometimes if you, nobody collect them, they, they still in the tree, but they've been dry. Okay. But, yeah, like this one, yes. Should we? Yeah, yeah, see, yeah, there's mm -hmm. a lot there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, here, um, you want to talk about sending Ahmed and getting cuttings? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm, uh, yani, when I, my age, like 13 or 14 years, I have three uh, sycamore tree near to my house, and a huge, very old tree. We collect always, you know, every day we collect the, the fruit, and we share it with my friend, but I realized this tree is disappeared. Then one day when uh, Dr. Victoria, she, she talked about all this tree and this is very interesting. Then I hear from my father, if you have a skin disease, then you collect the green fruit of the sycamores. They have white liquid. Then you can put it in your body to kill the disease. And uh, then I start this project. We I send my son Ahmed to collect the old tree nearby mm -hmm. to get some leaves. Mm -hmm. and some like twigs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. twigs. Mm -hmm. Then we cut them small pieces. Then we start to to make it return back to the life. Yeah, and we start to make them growing up. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, here we can see Mahmoud where he's cutting. We've got the little branches. He's cutting off the leaves, and then. We have a little, all the little sticks <laughs> in uh, some nice Nile mud. And then three weeks later, it took three weeks to see anything, <laughs> but we kept safe and kept watering it. <laughs> um, but you can see just a little teeny bit of green there. Those are the baby leaves just starting. Then five weeks later, they really, yeah, they're really taking off. Some of them, some of them, you know, it goes slowly for, for a lot of them. And then at seven weeks, we've got some nice full-size leaves there. 
and they seem established enough and really ready to transplant into the ground. But they seem slow growing, so I don't yes, know. Yes, the ones they take that... time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have to be patient. <laughs> yeah, when you grow, especially sycamores, they need time to grow. Mm. No rush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you give them some time, they grow bit by bit. Mm -hmm. Right. Until they're getting huge like this one. Yeah, so inshallah, wow. maybe, I don't know if, if I will live this long <laughs> to see our grow to this size, but yeah. Wow. Yeah, so um, so you spoke a little bit of some of the uses of jumais and and actually as with the dome, there is scientific, there are scientific articles out there where they are um, analyzing them chemically and, and looking at the effects and um, it's got all sorts of good, uh, good health, helpful yeah, benefits. Yeah, 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 very healthy. Mm -hmm. Do they, so they put the white um, latex that comes out when you break off the fig, they put that on your skin? No, you take the, the, the fruit, the green fruit, mm -hmm. the, the first part of the fruit, you break it up, then they have white liquid. You put them in your skin, the, the, the place they have the disease. Mm -hmm like three days, four days, day by day, it's like bearing the disease. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and then after four or five days, the disease is disappeared. Mm. Yeah, mm. very healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and did, did you, I read some medical articles that said that it's uh, effective against diarrhea, that sort of thing. Is that something that people have used it for in Ghana or did not really? No. Mm -hmm. They use the, 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 the acacia, some seed from the acacia for the area, mm -hmm. especially when you have a uh, sun like his two months or three months, then they get the seed, they boil the seed, then they give it to the child. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, uh, organic medicine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some of the medical uh, articles, I've got one reference here, and then this has its own bibliography. So anyone who's interested in following up on that sort of um, angle of, of this, there's a, a good bibliography in this article, um, but it's antifungal, it's antibacterial, it helps wounds to heal, and it also is um, a sedative and anticonvulsant and anti-diarrheal. So we need more jumates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there were some some big ones, right? That yes. um, that have been cut down for one reason or another. Is it it's, by the they they have they have three. Two have one very old and big one, and it's like if four bears and they open their arm, they cannot reach. They cannot uh, mm -hmm. have the end of the tree. Mm -hmm. It's disappeared. Mm -hmm. No one know this is disappeared. Did it die and people got it down or did it die? I, I don't know, mm. but uh, you know, day by day, nobody nobody think about this tree. But I love the always, you know, when we love to have some fruit, we run to this tree. Mm -hmm. All my friends, yeah, and this is very interesting mm -hmm. and very healthy. Mm -hmm. And the fruit, beautiful. It's bitter, bitter taste than the figs. Oh. Yeah, and this is the figs of the poor people. We love to have all those figs for free. This tree came from Allah. Then we run and get the fruit. Fa inshallah, and God help us to, to, to make this project return back. We, we start to grow a lot of gymnast tree. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so the last tree that we're going yes. to talk about is, it's known as the Persea in the literature. And um, I was fascinated, but the ancient Egyptian word is Ishid. So of which we have, as, as those of you who know um, Middle Egyptian or you know, have studied Egyptian language, uh, the ancient one, this is, mm -hmm. uh, we, we don't have a lot of the short vowels in between. So we, the pronunciation, in Egyptology, we just kind of put a little E, like we'll write it out, transcribe it with an E between consonants, just to give us some way to pronounce things. So you will see Ished tree in the literature, I-S-H-E-D. 
but what we have in the glyphs is, you know, is, so we know there's a vowel at the beginning, and then shed. And, mm -hmm. and so when Mahmoud said, oh, there's this tree I know, and it's the Ishda, I was like, wow, that's just like the ancient name for it. But there's the sh and the the should be, you know, next to each other with no vowel between them. And then there's an ah sound at the end. So, um, so this photo here is a tree. We'll come to this at the end after we talk about the ancient significance of the tree. But, um, but this is one that is growing uh, right here in the Luxor re region. Mm -hmm. Thanks to the Next Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, the Ishta tree I'm, is uh, tested as far back as the fourth dynasty and where it appears on as a regular element in the offering list. So I had to feature this one. Of course, this is from the Phoebe Hearst Museum at Berkeley where I just graduated. So, um, so hello to all my friends at the museum there. And this is our pride and joy, the Stila of Weapon Nofret. And here in his list of offerings, along with you know, his wine and um, eye paint and all the other things that he wants, there's um, ish, we see here ish, uh, so this again is um, ished fruits. So um, <clears throat> it also is a, a very common element in the New Kingdom. There are scenes in numerous temples with a king seated in, in the branches of it or you know, underneath the shade of it and the gods are inscribing his name. And this is to give him, you know, like a year for every leaf upon which this is inscribed. Um, so there's a, a really excellent article looking at the origins of this Ishad scene uh, by Welfert, uh, but also then, uh, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, but um, Ivashkuk, uh, published recently, more recently, looking at this connection between Senwosrit um, and Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III. So um, Velvert had said that the, um, the first attestation seems to be Tutmosis I. There are some blocks at Karnak, it's very incomplete, um, from the treasury there from North Karnak that were published that seem to be the um, the, the deceased king, Senwosert the I, leading Tutmosis I to the tree, and, and both of their names are inscribed on leaves of the tree. But, um, but then Ivashkuk argues that actually the style of it suggests to him that it should be, um, it, it's in honor of Tutmosis I, but it was decorated under Hatshepsut and Tutmosis III. So uh, the first extant version of this scene where, where we really have the whole thing is in Habu, Medina Habu, in the Tutmosis III Bark Chapel. And um, I didn't get a chance to go in there and get a picture of that. But uh, here at the Ramseum is a, um, a really lovely example of the scene. Thoth is off screen here, he's behind this pillar, but then there's Seshat and Atum who are writing the names onto uh, the leaves of the tree. So it seems to be associated with um, a king's years and that also with said festivals. So we see here um, what Seshat holds in her other hand is this renpet um, palm rib with all the little notches on it. Oops. And that's, um, and then here is the heb sign here and the sign for millions. So it's, it's giving him a you know, long reign and millions of, of heb sets. Um, and the text right behind him, there's this column behind the God here. And so this is a, um, it's got both gods together here. We've got Amun, Ray, Atum and uh, at the temple of the Ramesseum. And I wanna thank Mahmoud's brother, Khaled Althayim, okay. who's the inspector there for um, taking us on this tour and showing us this. Um, and he's saying that I behold, I make your name distinguished for eternity 
established upon the noble Ishta tree. Okay. So, um, and this, if, if you just drive along here on the West Bank in Luxor, this is the temple of Tutmosis III. And it's been really neat in the last few years to see in this uh, desert landscape with nothing alive, these beautiful green trees growing. And this is thanks to Miriam Sekwal Barras and her team that imported them actually from further south in Africa and brought them up special so that they could put these Ishta trees in the original tree pits belonging to the temple. Uh, the tree is also attested textually um, as being attributed something special for Heliopolis, the, um, the main seat of worship for the sun god Ray. And in the um, original stories, you, you hear about the Isha, Ishta tree being split by this great cat of Heliopolis during a big war during which the enemies of the Lord of all were destroyed. And then later versions, um, this cat is identified with Ra himself, and then he's cutting off, they've put a serpent in, representing all those enemies, and this is Apep, or Aphobis, and the cat is destroying him underneath the tree, the Ishta tree here. So another... Um, seen with the, the um, sick, these uh, sycamore trees. Oh, sorry, this is the sycamore. This belonged back with the Jumeas, <laughs> Um This is, um, these are sycamores. And here at Dendera, we've got two. There's one here. We've got the Ahed, the horizon, and then another tree right here. So they are on either side of it. Yeah, I'm sorry, gosh, this, this should have been back with the discussion of the um, Chinese Manish. Okay. Um, and this is Hathor uh, as the sun, basically. You've got Newt over the sky, the sun being born from her. And on the horizon, Hathor is being really syncretized with, um, with the sun and the sunrise. And we also have from a Theban tomb here at Daryl Medina, again, the tomb of Senegem. Uh, we've got Reharachte, identifiable with the sun disk on top of his head, and his name is also given to us. And we have, um, again, these two trees and the sun rising from them. And Reharachte is um, that form of ray associated with uh, the Ahit, the, um, the horizon. And um, these texts go back, those uh, as far at least as the coffin texts, and they describe the sycamores as being of turquoise. And it's interesting to note that Hathor, you know, is the lady of the sycamore is one of her titles. Also the lady of the horizon, the Ahat, and the lady of turquoise. So all of these things together. And um, then we see it visually in this late Roman temple to her at Dendera. Okay. But then getting back to our Ishta tree, um, this is the one that is near Habu Temple. And there's a close up. The, this photo was taken just a couple of days ago, mm -hmm. right? Um, the one on the left that shows the fruit is from last summer because it has not yet set any fruit for this year. Um, so, uh, what can you tell us about this tree? This tree, I, uh, I work in Cairo. Then I found this tree in Heliopolis, but I didn't recognize the fruit or the tree. Then I, I, I taste the fruit. I like it so much. Then I, I bring some seed to Luxor because I, I like the fruit. Then I start to grow, uh, to grow some from this tree. Then these three grow up. Then Dr. Am Shahat and Dr. Victoria Johnson, they talk about El Ishta. They said they have four seed inside or five seed. I said, yes, I, I realize this fruit. I, I, I eat this fruit, then they have four or five seed inside. Then I showed to Dr. Victoria Johnson. She told me this is Al, Al Ishta. It's returned back to the original country, to Luxor, by luck because I didn't recognize 
the, this tree or the, the fruit. I didn't know this is al ashet or al ishta. Then I bring it. Then they said this is al al ishta. Then I feel very happy that I I start with Dr. Victoria Johnson to have some seed to 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 grow this tree. Uh, yani, uh, we have a lot of from this tree because it's very tasty. Mm -hmm. And very interesting. It came by the chance, by the by luck, with me from Cairo to Luxor, and this is this is the tree. Yani, you see how it look like. It looks very healthy. Very happy to return back. <laughs> yeah. It does. It does. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's a beautiful tree. Yeah. Yeah, and it's loaded the fruit. Yeah. I have not been here in the summer to taste it fresh. But yeah. but also I didn't know Yani Dr. Maryam she bring this from the Africa or she start to, to have this plant. Then I realized later she, she brings some from this plant, but I do this before her by chance. Mm -hmm. Yani I didn't know this tree. Yeah, yeah, I don't know how many years more until her start bearing fruit. Yeah. But um yeah, but mashallah, it's nice yeah. that she's yeah, yeah. She's got those in the temple of Tutmosis mm -hmm. up there. Yes, these are, um, they taste, um, so the taste, so dome fruit, like taste, people describe it as gingerbready. And yeah, I, that's the closest thing. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, exactly. And then I, what do you think these taste like? Yeah, at the moment they use the uh, dome, they make juice mm -hmm. from the dome. Mm -hmm. They make uh, powder for high blood pressure, they use, uh, you can eat it, you can eat it uh, with, yani you can eat it natural and it's very healthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you take just, the, you take the skin, the skin of the dome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have, um, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, the dry, <laughs> the dry dome, Sometimes we use stone to take the skin. To take the skin of the dome. Then you start eating. Look at it. Mm. So this, I put it up to the camera. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. So then inside is like the hard nut <clears throat> that's, that's mm -hmm. white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's somewhat gingerbready. And then the, um, so this one is still moist enough that you can just eat it, just a little like that. Um, but when they're really dry, like if you get it from the spice shop, then you have to take something and break the, the outer casing off it's of it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, the skin. But um, yeah, the taste is kind of gingerbready. And then, mm -hmm. Uh, the the jumais the tree the sycamore fig I have not tasted that yet so I need to find out what that tastes like very tasty and then these very healthy. these ones the persia or the ishta mm -hmm. is um, is very soft it's it turns yellow when it's ripe yeah and um, again it's it's really unique I, you know I, I can't just I can't liken it to an apple or a pear or something you know that our audience might be familiar with. See, so is that it? okay? So, um, so that is what we have to share today. We want to thank Ann Austin for inviting us and thank coming up with much. this idea, and all the board of the RC Missouri chapter. Thank you so much, and everybody who tuned in. Um, and, and we want to give special acknowledgement to our friend Dr. Amr Khalif Shahat, and he's an archaeobotanist and a dear friend. And also um, Mahmoud's brother, Mr. Khalid al Fayyad, who's you. the inspector of the Ramseum. Yeah. So that is, that's that. And you can uh, be happy, very happy to answer questions. That was absolutely fascinating and amazing. And I have to be honest, I am so jealous that you just have the fruit right there to start eating. So. <laughs> 
not fair. Okay? Not fair. Not only are you in Luxor right now, you are just eating fruit right in front of us. Um, yeah. Bye. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we'll keep some for you yes please do yes um no and I, you know as you were as you were talking i was thinking about my next trip to luxor that i actually do need to take soon so i'm like i am coming to you and we're yes, going to have a fruit taste test yes. um, we've got a couple of questions and as we go through these um obviously everybody else please feel free to um put your questions in the q a so our first one is from Julia Troche. She says, thank you both so much for this truly fascinating talk. Are there examples of dome being used in antiquity for medicine or jewelry as well? Jewelry. Hmm. Well, the jewelry, yes, mm -hmm. right? So at least for the jewelry, um, that one example that I had from the, from Daryl Balas, uh, that Amr Shahat was the one who identified it as he was going through the botanical samples. Um, he said, well, look at that. It's like, it's been cut, you know, like along one side, just like this piece has, it's been, you know, cut. Mm -hmm. And um, as well as having a drill hole started in the top. So as in this case here, where they drilled in to make some jewelry. So, um, so yeah, so it's, so that was a really fascinating example of worked dome. And um, as far as medicine, there were some, um, I didn't run across it, but I did not do an exhaustive search of the medical papyri to okay. see um, if it was used at, for treatment of things. But the other two trees we talked a bit that, about, they definitely were. There were um, um, <clears throat> recipes or you know, remedies for jaundice and for upset stomach that called for either the um, Jumez tree or the Ishta tree. And, so, mm. and also they make the Mecca picture, uh, especially in Broncan Asyut, mm -hmm. the statue, the boat, all the soldier, all this is from the dome uh -huh. tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, dome but wood. Are you talking about modern, like things to send to tours or ancient? ancient. Oh, the ancient, yeah, yeah, yeah. ancient. the ancient yeah. Um, yeah. little models yeah. were from dome wood. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Cool, mm -hmm. okay. Wow. Yeah, because you mentioned that the wood was really strong. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. that's fascinating. Um, okay, great. Uh, how about a, another uh, question that has come in from Nicole Hansen? She says, is it possible to get seeds or cuttings from the trees from you? Yes. Seeds. Yeah, so we can, um, so Dom mm -hmm. uh, grow and the Ishta grow from seeds, mm -hmm. but the Jumais is something that I read that it has, to, there's a, a little insect that has to pollinate the, the thing. So um, you so you can't just take the fig off of it, you know, and like use that as something that would grow. So um, so for the jumais, you have to use cuttings, but yeah, that's what we're doing is we're trying to get some going and um, and make them available. So, yeah. that, you know, ex exactly. So yeah, can be transplanted replace some of because there are just so many um you, there's a fair amount of dome trees still around see the dome. Uh -huh. this is what you plant mm -hmm. oh wow and then um the but yeah the jumais trees there's a couple of nice youngish um uh samples at the carter house grounds in the gardens behind carter house but most of the other ones i have seen are few and far between and really ancient like there's one on the road to toward Aswan. Mm -hmm. It's just like this, this trunk and it's like a few little things coming out. And it's like, this thing is not gonna last very long. That's the one <laughs> I took the first cuttings off of. We're like, oh man. Save it. Yeah, save it. Um, that <laughs> is fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then the Persea, it produces a lot of fruit. So as far as we know, this is the only fruit producing Ishta tree, you know, in the whole area. Yeah. But wow. Because Miriam planted those few in the temple, but those are still quite young still. Mm -hmm. But this one that's about 10 years old yeah. and producing, you know, that we can get some saplings going from. Yeah. Cool. Excellent. Um, I've got two that have to do basically with um, kind of water and the trees. So the first one is from Joe Davidson, and he says, how do the trees get water without rain? And then the second one that is associated with that is from Barbara Wilcox. And she asks, why are the trees disappearing 
do they, right? Um, do they compete for water? Um, do they compete for water with farmers' crops? So I wonder if you could maybe tie both of those answers together. Hmm. Do you have a thought about that? So the why they're disappearing, because we were discussing this before, it's like he, Mahmoud has told me about a few really big old examples that are gone and maybe he was working in, you were working in Cairo and didn't know, did the people just cut it down or sometimes people build houses and eliminate a tree that's in the way or uh, like at the Taftish, you were saying there was a whole bunch of dome yes, trees yes, there. Yes, and they, that's right. Uh -huh. <clears throat> I don't know the real reason, mm -hmm. but it's disappeared mm -hmm. without reason. Mm -hmm. yani the, the old people very interesting to eat the fruit, mm -hmm. uh, the sycamores fruit. Mm -hmm. They like it, they love it very much. But they, they, this generation, they love to have something else. Uh, from, but the it's, uh, from the supermarket. From the supermarket. But uh, inshallah, yani we return these three back to the life. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh -huh. Yeah, I thought I think they haven't been just tended. Like I, we were talking about, did people like actively try to propagate them and make more in the past? And you said no. It was just sort of like if, if if you were lucky, you had one in in your yard, and you know it was just. A jemez like a mm -hmm. acacia tree, like a nabak, they came natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, just they, yeah, they just grow. <clears throat> Nobody tries to no. like you wouldn't farm. tend to them or or no. water them or anything like that. No. Oh, people yeah. are more interested in just yeah. like yeah, watering the wheat and watering yes, the. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, I did read something about the sycamore fig that it likes water. It likes to be like along canals and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, mm -hmm. and they do tend to do some clearing along the canals here. Every now and again, they'll come through and dredge and just like take away a lot of the, the you know beautiful things that are growing along the banks of the canal because yeah. they're sucking up the water that you know that they want to save for the crops so it's a bit of a battle yeah mm -hmm. um that excellent thank you so uh sid kitchell asks is it possible to use grafting to <laughs> propagate the trees i um well, so grafting would imply that you've got one kind of rootstock and then you're grafting something onto it. Uh -huh. I know a little bit about that because my grandfather grew avocados and that's what mm. he, um, <clears throat> so he had, you know, one kind of rootstock was really, you know, disease resistant. And then the Haas, you would graft that on because that's the type that, you know, sold well at the supermarket. Uh -huh. But um, I can't, I don't, you know, you that would imply like grafting a dome stalk onto a onto a regular date palm root. I I, I don't see that being. Um, I don't know what you would graft it onto. What, what okay. species you would mix it with? Yeah. Okay. Um, how long, Joe Davidson again asks, how long between sprout and fruit? <laughs> Do you know, well, with your Ishta, how long, how many years was it before it produced? Five, five, six years. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, five, six Not years. as long as I would think with how big the, a lot of those trees need to get. Yeah, mm. that's good. That's great. Um, what about the dome? Do you have any idea? Yeah, the dome take like 10, 15 years. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's like olives. Mm. Take long time. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, sometimes sometimes the tree uh, grow, but they never give fruit. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. So there are some dome palms that are male mm -hmm. and, and that don't ever produce fruit. Yeah. And then there's female ones that do. Uh, yeah, the dome is... The uh -huh, as the That's tree. like the date tree yeah. as well, has male and female types. Mm -hmm. Um, but mm. the Jumais, they all... Oh, you know? yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But what I realized from the Sycamores, mm -hmm. uh, they, yeah, since like 20, 30 years, the fruit is huge, like the size of the dome. It was. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now the, 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 it's very small, very little bit. Uh -huh. I don't know why is this. Maybe it needs more water, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 
Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, we've got one final question for you. And it also um, has to do with the fruiting. This is from Roseanne Cleansing. She's um, part of RC Missouri. Um, she uh, asks, are these fruits available at local markets or are the trees too scarce right now? The dome. The, the, the dome. dome is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just the, yeah, the Persea. We have the only tree that's producing mm -hmm. fruit in, oh, at wow. all, you know. Um, and then the the um, Jumeis, no. they're around, but you mm -hmm. don't see that in the, in the soup or anything, no, do you? No, no. Mm -hmm. But the dome, you definitely do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you want to talk about like how they, they sell it at the spice shops, they... Yeah, they sell it in spice shop, they sell it in Cairo, in Hargada, they sell it as a powder, they sell it as a fruit, they sell mm -hmm. it as a basis. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had a picture, so you can get, there's the whole um, dome nut, you know, like this, there was a, um, one site had a whole, you know, basket full of these at a spice shop. And then uh, they also mm. will take it and just break off the outer part into chunks. And I guess people then, um, what would you do with it? it? Just eat it like that? Yeah, yeah, if it, it was just, mm, yeah. it just makes it easy so you don't have to <laughs> lose the tooth, you know? Mm. <laughs> and then, um, and then, you, and then they also like Mahmoud, so they grind, they have it in powdered form. And you would put that in water and make um, make a juice, juice out of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Full of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I bet. Well, thank you so yeah. very much. Um, I think uh, Stacy is going to um, close this up for us. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Kate. Um, and thank you to our lovely presenters today. This has been a very, very interesting lecture and I think we're all just really excited and so we want to kind of keep keep aware of your progress so so check in once in a while we definitely want want this project to succeed so thank you for sharing this all with us sure, sure. Um, so um one big round of applause again we don't really have an audience but uh, I know that everyone enjoyed it um, and if you are interested, any of our audience, we will have three more lectures this spring. So our next one will be on March 26th. And this will be Mr. James Terry, who will be describing his process of replicating ancient Egyptian scribal palettes. Um, you can get more information about that if you follow our social media or check our website. We'll have a link there. Um, pretty soon for you to register for that one. It will be free and open to the public as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you again, everyone, for spending part of your Saturday with us. And we hope you enjoyed yourself. And we hope we will see you soon in another lecture. Take hey, care. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>